So all of that to say, just again, we're very thankful for our country and the freedoms it affords us and so many people who come here looking for a better life. But in order to try to make that life that we're living even better and to try to enrich the culture in which we live, which in many cases, as good as it is, is often very flawed um, and tending towards chaos and tending away from God and the truth. We want to contrast, as we mentioned, the American popular understanding of freedom and the church's popular understanding of freedom. So this, this, this article that we're referencing is literally called Con- Two Contrasting Notions of Freedom or Conceptions of Freedom. And what the author of this this article does is he talks about freedom under three different aspects and relays or describes how the secular world views freedom under those three different aspects. And then in contrast, how the church or how the Christian tradition more broadly views freedom under those three different aspects. So those three aspects, the f- three different kinds of freedom that he talks about, because, right? Because when we say freedom, a lot of times we mean many different things. So this is just kind of grammatical work, clarifying our terms. The three different kinds of freedom he talks about in this article in which we're going to talk about today are what he calls external or political freedom. So that's number one. Another is interior or natural freedom. That's number two. And moral freedom. That's the third type of freedom that he wants to talk about. And the secular worldview has a definition of what each of those thing each of those things is according to its own ideology. And then the church, the Christian tradition also has a definition of what those three types of freedom truly are or truly ought to be according to its worldview. So Max, why don't we start by analyzing how the secular worldview, how American culture in general, but then the secular worldview of the West talks about or thinks about these three different kinds of freedom, right? So let's begin. Can you help us understand what does the secular world think of political or external freedom? What, what is that in the mind of secular Americans and Westerns? Okay, so before we go into defining it, let me just take a step back here, right? And just give a, a few names we've mentioned on our episodes before. And I think oh, it's yeah, important because call. it helps give, give and build the kind of philosophical framework that then gives rise to these definitions lived, uh, lived out. So a few names some of you may be familiar with, right? Rene Descartes, right? I believe he's a French philosopher. Is that right, Joey? Yeah, that's right. He was French. Rene Descartes, Immanuel Kant, and John Locke. Right. And so these are kind of some of the head, some of those who led the headway on what we would call the Enlightenment movement, which are embodied then in some of these definitions on, of freedom. The first of which is what we're going to call or what the article calls political or external freedom. And simply the author defines this level or this degree of freedom as, oh, there's a fly in my face. That's kind of gross. Um, as means. Like God's creatures, dude. Yeah, Show some well, respect. We'll get on my face. God's creature, all right? Then we won't have any problems, all right? Coexist somewhere else, my friend. That's all I got to say about that. All right. So political or external freedom, what is this thing? All right. It means not being commanded by another to act in one way rather than another. All right? So simple. Think about this like an external freedom, right? Literally somebody from the outside pressuring you to do or to commit a certain action rather than another. So that's the first one. Pretty simple, I think. Right. And yeah, it's simple, but it's it's also very important, right? Because in in the minds of these enlightenment thinkers who have bequeathed us, man, we're using all types of weird words, today, but bequeathed <laughs> us with this liberal heritage, this liberal notion of freedom. In their minds, this is really so. External political freedom consists always in being free from the commands of others, right? So if I'm going to be free, then nobody can be telling me what to do. I have to be autonomous. I have to be, that literally means a law unto myself. I have to be directing my own actions completely. That's what political or external freedom is in the mind of, well, many Americans, in the mind of American culture, in the mind of enlightenment liberal thinkers. And that's even the case if what someone's telling me to do is good for me, right? For a liberal, for a secular, in the secular understanding, If anyone tries to tell me to do anything, 
that is contrary to my political or external freedom. And so if I'm going to be politically or externally free, I have to be free from the commands of, of other people. Right. So that's, that's kind of our first definition. Yeah. And I, I think we'll go back to this later, but that's not completely terrible. That's not bad necessarily. We'll get into why, what some of its downfalls, but necessarily being commanded by another to do something is not always a bad thing, but it should not be the only way we live our lives. So the first one, we got political or external freedom. The second of which, Joey, talk to us about that. Well, the second kind of freedom that this author talks about is what he calls internal, interior, or natural freedom, right? So in the, in the mind of the secular world, this type of freedom is, again, kind of what I just mentioned, the ability to move myself, to be autonomous. It's the completely undetermined self-movement of the will. Right. And when I don't, I don't know, what, do, you, do you want to flesh that out for us, Max, especially the part about being undetermined? Yeah, right. And I think this is, this is very important, right? So one of the things we hold as, let's say, Americans, let's say as Western people is the fact that nobody should be able to kind of force our will to move in a certain direction. Right. Another way to say it is we think that things are or I should say people act arbitrarily. That freedom should be arbitrarily done. It's not determined. There's no nature. There's no definition. Nobody should be telling me this. Nobody should be doing that. Because if they do, then I'm going to act a certain way from the interior. Right? What's a, what is the distinction here between external and internal? External, somebody from the outside pressuring you to do this, to say this, to think this. Interior, something comes from the inside. Somebody, somebody is telling me to move in a certain way. So here there's more of a kind of a, an autonomous sense. When we talk about interior freedom, you're not determined by anything. You yourself right. have the right to choose whichever way or however you want to. Right. So according to the secular mindset, somebody has this internal freedom, this what the author calls natural freedom. If they have the they they are exercising, I should say, this interior freedom when they make any decision at all. Right. So whatever as long as I have the capacity to make a decision to choose between various options according to my pleasure, really that in the, in the very exercise of making that choice, I am free, right? So it doesn't necessarily matter what I'm choosing. What matters is that I'm choosing. That is how these liberal secular thinkers would understand this interior freedom that they say man has. It's merely the ability to choose whatever you want, whenever you want, as long as you have the capacity to do that, and in the very act of doing that, you are exercising what they would call freedom, right? So um, again, in a second, we'll, we'll talk about the truth of this claim and then the deficiency of this claim. But at the very outset, that is what this interior or natural freedom is in the secular mindset. And then finally, um, finally, we have the, the third category of freedom, which is moral freedom, right? It's moral freedom. So do you want to tell us what that is, Max? Yeah, and I think just as an outset, none of these are completely disconnected. They all have they all deal with the person. Right? They're all lived realities. Right? So it's important to keep in mind as we're talking about this. I mean, we we kind of lay them out with definitions and categorically, but there's not because they're completely distinct from each other, but because to help in order to articulate the argument, I think this is helpful. Okay, so the first we had um, external freedom, internal freedom, and now we have moral freedom, right? So moral, what right the, the, the to act act in a certain way. The article def defines moral freedom as not being determined by cultural uh, pressures, right? One is free to choose one's own values. And I would say that's one of the things right now, most popularly, that's being held as kind of freedom. Nobody should tell me how to live my life. Nobody should indoctrinate me into a certain way of thinking or living or order. I should be able to determine my, my, own, my own race, my own gender, my own sexual impulses, um, these kinds of things, I think is what we see today. And so when we talk about moral freedom, it's the ability to choose one's own value system and, and yeah, to keep it succinct. Right, exactly. So that's so important. Yeah, in the, in the secular worldview, somebody is morally free when they are deciding for themselves what to value, what's good and what's bad, right? When they're not being pressured into value judgments from the culture or from their parents or from the government, but they are in and of themselves determining 
what is valuable and then pursuing those things. So, and I would say, Joey, if I might add, I think in today's contemporary culture, that's kind of one of the characteristics that marks it, namely that it's anti-institution, right? It's anti any cultural references. It's anti-religion. It's anti a lot of things in the name of building its own society. Because why? Because it wants to build its own value structures rather than submitting itself to another. That could be good. It could be helpful. It could be traditional in the name of the contemporary spirit. So anyways, just a little addition there. Right. So this is the, and I think that's well said, this is the secular mindset's understanding of freedom. Man is free politically when the government is not telling him what to do. Man is free interiorly in the very process of making arbitrary decisions. It doesn't matter what those decisions are, but in the very act of choosing, he is exercising freedom. And man is free morally, they would say, when he's determining for himself what his values are, when he's refusing to be pressured into having certain values based on the culture or any standard that is given to him from the outside. So this is kind of the, and, and if you're hearing this and you're thinking about um, some of the aspects of our culture that we see, some of potentially the, some good ones, some bad ones, that's, that's probably because, well, this author is correct in diagnosing what the secular world understands by freedom and really what a lot of the American founding fathers understood by the concept of freedom. So before critiquing this, Max, and contrasting it with the Christian worldview, let's talk about what's good about it. Why what did what did the founders what did what does our secular society have right what are they what is good about this understanding of freedom that we've just laid out we should desire to have independence like both as a country in this particular instance where we were celebrating july 4th but as a person like we are an individual we are a subject and that's very important that was important to christ he came to save us as a people but he came to save you individually here being the the emphasis on the subject. And so it's, it's important that as we talk about this and as we critique this, to always keep in mind that one of the great aspects about, I think, underlining all of these definitions is this desire to have independence, right? To be dependent um, and to have room to, to develop and have room to move and have room to expand. That's a good thing. That's, so that's, yeah, that's just one of the positive characteristics of these conceptions, I would say. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think that idea especially is important to understand in light of a lot of, well, in light of a lot of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century that sacrificed the individual for the sake of this abstract collective, right? So the Nazi party, like, or the communist party, these, these ideologies dispensed with individuals and even destroyed them at times for the sake of the collective, and what the founders are saying and what Americans intuit in their understanding of freedom and what our, our secular culture tends to at least intuit in its understanding of freedom is that, no, we, Max just said it exactly right. We are subjects with dignity, with consciences, and we have a right in, in a very real sense given to us by God to move and act freely according to our own deliberations and determinations. And the American understanding of freedom respects that. The American system of government respects that and protects it, which is why we're able to speak freely, which is why we're able to do this podcast, Max and I, which is why we're able to exercise the religion that we desire, right? So yeah, I think you're right, Max. It, and this, is a, this was a big mark of modern philosophy, enlightenment philosophy in general, right? It's this turn towards the subject. It's this right. deepening appreciation of the dignity of the individual human person, the freedom of of the individual human person. I had a unit, a whole unit in my freshman humanities class in high school called freedom of individual thought. And that was, that was presented to us as among the highest values that exist in the world is the ability of the human person to think freely and act freely. And although we're going to say that freedom of individual thought is not the highest value no. in the world, it is certainly a value and it is something to be, to be valued and cherished. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, the good part of our American ideal of freedom. I don't know if you have any other comments on, on the positive aspects of this secular worldview. 
So you had mentioned just now, like the ability to do this podcast, the ability to choose a religion, to choose a faith, to live a certain lifestyle. Um, and I think that's another thing. Uh, and it's related to maybe just a general kind of positive uh, spirit of these definitions that it allows us to kind of have different and conflicting views and hopefully from it emerges an objective reality, an objective view, an objective definition, and and, and, and an honest dialogue. That's the idea here, right? Um, to use Hegelian terms, right? We have a, a thesis, right? Somebody proposes something. You have an antithesis. We have somebody opposing a conflicting view. And hopefully in the battle between the two, we can find some sort of a synthesis, something that we agree upon as, oh, this is the true thing, this is a good thing. I think one of the things that we have, um, as positive as that characteristic is, one of the things we have in today's culture is that there's only larger contrast and bigger distinctions rather than any sort of synthesis happening. And so when people try to enter into discussion about those things which we view as valuable, the very principles hard to agree upon by which to have an objective discussion, which by which to have something good. And so, you know, while we have the ability to grow, while we have the ability to, to progress, to develop, to move, always keeping in mind it's all oriented towards not just the ability to choose, but the ability to choose what we would say the good, right? Not just with the first principle in mind, as Joey was saying earlier, right? We have these goods in front of us and we're able to choose that's not the highest good. The highest good, that's, that's a start. But the highest good is actually to choose the good thing, the true thing, the beautiful thing. And I think that in an honest take, this freedom of conscience, this freedom of movement, this freedom of this independence, as we would call it popularly, enables this. But I think, unfortunately, today we have a lot of misguided people, including ourselves at times, Joey, if we're honest with ourselves, have these conceptions of freedom and then live them out in such a way that that we hurt ourselves and we damage ourselves, which is why we need authorities, which is why we need institutions, which is why we need certain systems and value structures to help guide this, this desire for freedom, which we all have, because ultimately we desire freedom and unity with God, our creator. Yeah, so Max, you had a really good um, point that you wanted to make regarding gk chesterton but before you do that i just want to go going off what you said the so yes one of the positive aspects that the american conception of freedom brings with it is the capacity to you said it to to dialogue it it affords us the opportunity to debate and to exchange ideas which hopefully and ideally and theoretically has the capacity to bring us all into deeper conformity with the truth with what is really true but if you look at the American culture right now, if you look at our political discourse, precisely the opposite seems to be happening to me. People are often incapable of engaging in real dialogue. And when they do attempt to engage in conversation in the public forum, it often leads into deeper and deeper divisions. And I think that's indicative of one of the primary mm. flaws of the American notion of freedom, namely that it is divorced completely from any objective truth or value structure, right? So because freedom for the American mind is the ability to do, to think, to say whatever I want, so long as it doesn't quote unquote hurt somebody else, then I get to determine what's good. I get to determine what's bad. And if I am the sole determiner of truth, if I am the sole arbiter of truth, then in a very real way, dialogue becomes impossible because dialogue is only possible between two persons if we are both approaching an objective reality about which we're trying to discover more, right? If we're not, if we don't actually admit that there's an objective order, if there's an objective truth, if there's an objective value system out there in the world to which we are trying to correspond, then we're going to be talking past each other. And this relativism that allows everyone to just seemingly think that they can invent truth for themselves is a negative consequence of the American understanding of freedom.